Right, right off the back of this, I'll be talking to Ian Renton, who's the managing director of Cheltenham and the West for the Jockey Club, about this idea to have a consultation period into a five-day Cheltenham festival, which is at the back of these talking points. We'll start with the Breeze Up sales. The Breeze Up sales season is now in full swing. We've got Goffs next week. We just had the Tattersall's Craven Breeze Up sales. The prices were high once again. Um, Roger, were you there? Did you have any joy? What was the kind of general vibe around the town this week? Yeah, good good buzz around the town. Um, I think there always is this week, Craven Week sales. Things are starting again. Sun was out. So, um, no, uh, you know, the sales were strong. I thought uh, prices were high. And, um, you know, it gives you encouragement, doesn't it? You know, all the negativity sometimes we spin. Yeah. It's, you know, every every sale that comes to town never ceases to amaze me. You know, the, the enthusiasm yeah. that is out there to buy horses. So, no, it's great. But of course, we saw a lot of U.S. buyers as well, and increasingly more foreign buyers coming in to uh, try and buy horses that are bred either here or in Ireland. Is that just an extension of what you were talking about earlier on? Absolutely. You know, we always previously associated the, the trade of horses to uh, overseas as being horses in training, and I think now what you're seeing, and, and this is, you know, we'll, we'll have a knock in, knock on effect. I think book one last year there was a, you know, a frightening percentage of those horses, although the market was strong, the percentage of those horses that were bought not to race in the UK or Europe, you know, was uh, concerning. Yet the same week, we, we, we see that there's a likely clash at Royal Ascot, Neil, between the best turf sprinter in the United States in, in Golden Pal yeah. and possibly the best sprinter in the world in Nature Strip, trained in Australia, all running for OK, good prize money, but relative to their home countries, relatively meagre money, simply because of the heritage of, of British racing. But we, how long can we rest on that reputation? Well, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, you know, <clears throat> unless you're going to grow the, you know, the pool of money that's available for prize money, you do just have to make that decision on where you're going to put it. And, um, you know, Roger obviously made the case earlier for the middle tier being where it's needed. Um, I, I saw uh, Mike Spence was on Twitter getting a lot of stick the other week for saying basically take it all away from the bottom tier. They don't really need any money at all, hardly any money at all, and get and get it up the you know up the pole. But of course everybody tends to speak from where they see themselves in the equation, you know. And uh, lots of people would say, well, you have to have you have to stack the top because you want it to be aspirational. It's a pyramid. And people need to think that they've got a chance of getting to the top and, and getting the big money. We've gone over two minutes, is what you're thinking. That's all right. We always go over but, two um, minutes. But I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, obviously my solution would be just have way less racing um, if you're going to just keep the prize, the, the pool of prize money the same. But uh, uh, yeah, it is kind of funny that we have so many conversations where people are talking about how the prize money is not enough, but every time there's a sale. Uh, things seem to be buoyant. Even in the COVID times, you know, sales were buoyant. Sometimes in this sport, you need to get the simple things right as well, like getting races off to time if you want to generate the maximum revenue for the sports coffers. That's something that we singularly failed to do yesterday across an awful lot of venues. And of course, here, uh, when we're busy on racing mm. TV on a Saturday afternoon, that's not great from a viewing experience either. Um, interestingly, however, Cork, who had a medical emergency yesterday and had every right mm -hmm. to be delayed, managed to, managed to catch up significantly. If you look at the 250 that went off at 323, the 545 still went off at 545. At Newbury, where there was no such I emergency, we got, and this is not picking on Newbury because this is the case at all sorts of British race courses, the just general drift through the afternoon. They did catch up a bit by the last race, which only went off a couple of minutes late, but five minutes late for the seventh, four minutes late for the sixth, four minutes late for the fifth. We know it's difficult with young horses and saddling and whatnot, Roger, but every other country in the world manages to get their races off on time. We sometimes somehow don't. don't, And I don't really know why. No, well, lots of, li lots of little things, isn't it? It's accumulative through the afternoon. Um, I think our starts um, regularly uh, are slow you know it can you can see it taking six seven eight minutes to load a feel of 14 horses you know and that's um that has a knock-on effect and that uh, in itself you can get the jockeys out on time you can get them on the horses on time you can get them down to the start on time we need more stools handlers i think we need more stools handlers i don't think i know we need more stool, stools handlers and um i think that uh you know if you can get them down to the start on time they should be loaded on time mm. and that's where the that's where the lag is isn't it it's the lag when they get to the to the gate 
I think so. I think it's a, a, a cumulative uh, responsibility of a trainer to make sure their horses are well schooled at the starting gates so that they're you, you can deal with animals, you'll deal with personality, you guys have an odd horse play up. Mm-hmm. But I think um, if we can present the horses um, generally well behaved and, and easy to load, then we need enough stools handlers to get them in. Yeah, I mean, we, we have this in, in time. Yeah. But in, ter- in terms of all other elements of the sport, you know, the BHA would issue fines to people for doing stuff wrong, in inverted commas. Well, I mean, the, the courses don't get fined for the no, races they, being late. They, I mean, Newbury's they, a bit of a bad to, one, isn't it? You well, say you don't want to pick on them, but, well, but they, they are a little bit naughty. Sandown was bad. Well, yeah. Sandown were bad, but then they got uh, ITV's... Mm. Saturday Sky Bet Saturday. Yeah, try and get this right. <laughs> so many other things, I can't almost forget what they are. ITV's Sky Bet Sun, Super Sunday Super series Sunday. last yeah. year. They were running at like twenty-seven minute gaps or something mm, to mm. try and sure jazz it up a bit and make it quicker. And they they coped with it. Mm, they did mm. it, having said for years, well, we can't we can't cope with anything less than a thirty-five mm. minute gap. I sort of think you can just. Yeah, mm. I would have thought so. I mean, it just, the infrastructure needs to be. I don't know. I mean, do they need to just introduce small fines for courses that are continually I, late? I should have asked this before we came on, and I'm slapping myself on the wrist for not. The BHA used to hold an inquiry every time a race was more than three minutes late mm. off. I mean, a sort of you know a quiet mm. inquiry. I don't know if that's still the case, but I'll I'll find out for for next week. Where are we going next? So Mark Todd, uh, like that. Uh, his hearing did take place with about 10 minutes notice to the media uh, and when it did take place he was given a four month suspension two months of which were suspended so he can reapply for his license because it is time served mm. neil i mean there's two parts to this aren't there the process and the penalty well the penalty um, i wasn't hugely shocked i didn't think oh my god that doesn't seem enough um it felt like roughly what I expected him to get. But having said that, uh, yeah, it did sort of all come rather quickly, didn't it? That it suddenly it was announced, oh, we've had a quick look at it, and he's uh, he's had some time out already, so um, he's, back, he's back in the game. Um, and then there was this thing that the media didn't get given any notice of it. It was a bit kind of weird, wasn't it, that? There's an interesting point that, that Lydia made earlier on in the week when we were talking on the podcast, and that's this definition of J19 conduct prejudicial mm, to, yeah. to, to horse racing. And, and the, it's they're, very vague. Yeah. They're needing to be some kind of slightly more clear definition of this, mm. Roger, if this is the rule that is going to be impl- uh, applied. There needs to be some kind of debate and discussion as to exactly how this impacted on the on the good reputation of horse racing and you know and, and what the kind of ramifications of that really are before you just sort of arbitrarily put a punishment on the table yeah the, in, the ins and outs of what you're talking about nick um, I, um lack, lack the knowledge really to to give my viewpoint but um it's uh, it's obviously a delicate um situation and it's uh it, it you know the video itself is one that um sir mark won't won't be proud of and, and, and no one can condone but um, there'll always be a, a difference uh, uh, between um, people who, who don't work with animals and people who do work with animals and um, training animals whether you're training racers or training dogs or training animal actors or, or whatever you're doing you know with horses um, there's uh, there's there's that fine line isn't there between uh, understanding um you know how, how to get animals to do to do uh what you want them to do and and uh, uh, the majority um you know a, a polo and a carrot works and and occasionally um it doesn't and uh you know when talking about sir mark uh, todd um his career and um his reputation i i, I think knowing him just a, a little bit that he's the most incredible horseman and um i think that uh and horse lover and i think that um that hasn't changed and that will continue to be the case and um uh, the, the, the case uh of this video doesn't uh, certainly doesn't need condoning and um that's not what i'm doing but um i think sir mark todd is a as an individual and as a horseman mm-hmm. um is uh, I hope his reputation is intact because I think um, he's, 
he's very much a horse lover and uh, just, I, I hope that, that, that just story. quickly, if it had happened like a year earlier, mm. like before he ever had a license, would the BHA have had to do anything at all? No, not if he wasn't a licensed person, and it was not. It was not. And do you, think, do you think people within racing and the racing media and the public would be fine with that? Uh, well, but if it, but if he didn't have a, a trainer's license and he wasn't somebody who mm. was who was licensed by the because it was like body. it was like it was a very it was within a month of him having a license wasn't it it was quite early on at ah, the time sorry so, so, the, so the video I, I see what you're saying so yeah. had he not had a license at the time when the offence exactly took place, yeah uh, no because he has a license I think they probably still would have had to have done mm. something um, because it's effectively the same the same offence no, I just wondered I, I don't I'm not really sure on the answer to that I just, no yeah well I I'm not either but. Um, we're going to move on and talk about Mark Johnston, uh, who this week said, it's effect who effectively said this week is... Hang on, that bell's confusing me now. I'm, I'm completely confused. Right, we're going to talk about Mark <laughs> Johnston, who uh, this week... Uh, it's, a, it's a familiar refrain. He's played this tune a few times before. He certainly has. Racing is focused too much on betting, and it's coming home to roost now that uh, racing's reliance on betting is being threatened by the gambling review, mm. Neil. So what do, you, what do you make of Mark Johnston's comments? Well, I mean, he, he's right in that racing is intrinsically linked to betting. Uh, you know, the, the media rights uh, that provides the prize money that everybody whines about comes from earnings from people losing at betting on horse racing. Um, and if, if you want to break that link, well, you're going to have to find, uh, find the money from somewhere else. Um, I mean, from from the point, if you ask the question, who who wants, who needs who most? Does betting need racing, or does racing need betting? Uh, it's a very unequal battle. Racing needs betting way more than betting needs racing, and I think racing would do well to remember that quite often. Uh, you know, having said all of that, I I, I I didn't actually read what he said. I somebody I saw people commenting about it on Twitter. And uh, so I, I may not have got it exactly right, but was, was he not sort of saying that there's an overemphasis in racing media and coverage on betting? Yeah, that's what he's um, always said. He's always which said, is what he always the, said. The, the presentation yeah. of the sport I is actually, too contingent on I actually on, don't really think that's betting. the case. Like when you watch, I mean, I, I, I generally watch, um, you'll be glad to hear my racing through racing TV, but... Um, I do uh, record ITV racing and watch it later normally. And actually, I, I don't think they focus on betting all that much at all, really. You know, it's, a, it's often a three hour program and it, it doesn't take up more than about 10 percent of the coverage. And for most people watching it, I, I think it, it's, it's way more important than that. I mean, I understand what Mark is saying, that racing's entire sort of financial uh, health is based on is based on on gambling, mm. but what's the alternative? What's the? I mean, how are we going to? I mean, how are we going to make money otherwise? How's the sport going to be funded without betting? Can I, I can't think of a, too many jurisdictions in the world, apart from those in the Middle East, that aren't funded in part or in uh, whole by betting. What you say is quite right, but um, you know our whole funding model is is, is a little bit defunct, really. Um, and but we have to work within the um, parameter of uh, of the uh, funding mechanism, mm. which is you know, media rights and and betting. Mm. And um, the uh, you know anything gambling review or whatever, anything that threatens either media rights or or, or betting, essentially threatens the, the the funding of the sport. And you know it. it we should all be concerned by that, but in, unless there's a, um, a brand new, um, let's say, a system funding model around the corner, you know, we we have to rely on on what we've got and maximise it, you know, through media rights and through betting. But there's, we'd, we'd love it to be something else, wouldn't we? But I think that however many years. People have been trying to come up with different ways of funding our sport, and we we are where well, we are. We'll talk about Whirlpool in a minute, but if you are, if you are if you want the most stimulating product possible, should racecourses be allowing trainers such as yourself to run horses in racecourse gallops uh, and and not oblige them to run them in in trial races that are there for that very same purpose and therefore render the sport less competitive and less interesting? Um. 
I don't think I've got a, st a strong opinion either way. I think that um, it seems to be quite uh, the norm, quite accepted now, you know, to have race course gallops. Do you do it? I think much? it happens in Ireland. I think it happens in England. I don't know if it happens in France. I should think it probably does. No, we don't do it much. We do it occasionally. Um, it's not about... We have all the facilities um, that you could ask for in Newmarket. We have the best grass gallops, I think, in the world. We have all weather gallops. We have hill gallops. We have flat gallops. We have turning gallops. We have straight gallops. So, you know, if we can't get a horse ready to race at home in Newmarket, um, you know, then there's probably a problem there. But what what taking the horse to the race course gallop does is it gets it in the horse book, gets it, you know... The, adrenaline up the juices flow and, and it brings them on psychologically as much as the actual gallop itself yes you could argue then take it to a trial and i think that's that's the point you're trying to make is it that's the, the well, that's the counter argument i i i'm, I, just, I, I, I'm putting the i'm yeah. putting the case to you yeah. i mean i saw I, I did see a couple of race course bookmakers tweeting this week to say that there was a very low crowd at the craven meeting and uh, that I don't think the prices were too bad. You know, the race course admission seemed to have quite fair prices. Mm. It was cheaper uh, to go to the Craven meeting than it was to go to, um, I think, Worcester two weeks earlier on a, on a Monday. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether Newmarket are not marketing the meeting well enough uh, because there was a very thin crowd there. They do get thinner crowds. Where are you going mile. with this? Well, well, I just I wonder whether... You know, I thought the racing was top quality, I but, uh, and, and, and I really enjoyed the, the, it. This is a specific but, point but you about could race say, You could say that, you know, if, if you're going to allow the trainers, you know, to run their horses without... One of the gallops we had this week, we didn't even know the names of the horses. It, 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 the commentator on course wasn't able to tell us what we were watching. Um, you know, maybe there's a reason why people are, are coming less often to the races. If stuff is happening not behind closed doors because it's obviously in front of people but they don't really know what they're watching they don't really know what horses they are what weights they're carrying whatever i i don't know i did see steve morana from uh kazoo um ex of betfair exactly and he was talking about so i i, I don't want to nick his idea but he was saying in a lot of other sports to get to the final of something you have to qualify uh and you know in the long term for the long term good of racing might it be an idea that for the classics you have to run in a trial? Uh, well, in order Kentucky to qualify. Derby, for example, you need yeah. points to get into the, yeah. into the race. Yeah. Is that something that our system would ever would ever allow for? I don't think we should ever be, um, you know, completely closed off to to new ideas and 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 to change and um, you know, racing. I think has to do what it can to. To uh, you know, market itself, brand itself, and to appeal to to a, a wider audience. And you know, I, I you know, not every idea is going to work. But I'm all for people coming up mm. with some um, you know different uh, ideas, radical ideas that people can talk about and see if they would work. Um, we were very recently just digressing. We were very recently we were in Bahrain and went to the Grand Prix of Formula One. It's the first time I've ever seen it. It was an incredible experience. Now racing can't match Formula One for many reasons, but it, they've just got it to a T. Marketing, um, the experience, uh, the energy, and um, somehow racing's got to try and invigorate um, the fans mm. and, and reach a wider mm. audience. And if we're not doing it at the moment, we've got to think why why aren't we doing it and what we can do differently to 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 make it a bit more yeah. gripping to the wider people, not just the people who understand it and like mm. it already. Yeah, I, I I hear you. I hear you. There was a, a, a incredibly wealthy race in Australia recently, worth however many million dollars, where um, members of the public effectively got to choose the horses that went in the race, and then mm. there was a panel that mm. put in a few wild cards in case they'd missed the in case they missed the obvious, and no one's up in arms about that. Imagine doing that here. <laughs> we're, we're getting our knickers in a twist about a fifth day to the Cheltenham Festival, more of which in a few moments. Is Whirlpool the silver bullet for this sport? Um, Neil Channing, explain uh, well, for those who go, oh, what's Whirlpool? Explain okay, quickly, so, uh, and is it the, is yeah, it the so silver obviously bullet? Obviously, the tote mm. uh, take bets uh, largely uh, from people on course and from people off course. Um, but the days when the tote really works and is really good, and, and obviously the tote give, I think it's 5% of their profits go back into 
UK racing. Uh, the days when the tote have a really strong pull and uh, when, when you can really go and have a, you know, a chunky bet without worrying about the dividend is when they open it up to the rest of the world. And essentially, uh, a lot of that is opening it up to the Hong Kong market where people love to uh, bet. They don't mind betting on, on foreign racing. They're, they're not so keen on jumps racing, apparently, uh, but they like the flat racing. Royal Ascot is very popular on the world pool. And obviously, if there are horses ridden by jockeys that have ridden in Hong Kong in the past, uh, or horses that have run in Hong Kong in the past, they tend to be very well bet in the world pool, which means that the market moves about a bit differently to the the SP market in the UK. So you might get a situation where uh, a, a, a horse from Japan, or or if there's one from Hong Kong running at Royal Ascot, could go off a very short price. Uh, in the in the world pool uh, relative to its chances with the the bookmakers and and w- once you get a divergence like that then that breeds even more turnover and obviously if if UK racing is getting five percent of that well that's good for UK racing and um, UK racing is going to get more because the world pool is happening on more and more races now and they kind of launched that this week I found it interesting that John Gosden. Uh, spoke quite a bit about um, how this can benefit racing and prize money in the long run and blah, blah. Um, throughout this gambling review process, which has dragged on for a long time now, haven't actually heard too many horsemen talking about it when uh, the, the, I think there's an element of people saying, oh, well, it's it's gambling and that, that's not really our thing. Uh, but actually, it's it's hugely important yeah. to you know the industry as a whole, and I'm talking about the horse racing industry rather than the gambling industry. Uh, so I was quite pleased to see that, that you know it opened up that conversation among the trainers a little bit. I have been lax on time here, so you I'm going to have to move on to the okay. last the last one, which of course is the five day festival. In all honesty, this is about as much time as I want. <laughs> As I, as I we must get because I'm just so cross. I've been talking about it every time, day for the last times. ten years. Just me, if you're going to do it, just do it. Let me tell you one thing. And if you're not, then don't. Let me tell you one thing quickly. It, my niece went to the Cheltenham Festival for the first time this year. The first time she'd been horse racing. She was supposed to go with a group of girls for a hen thing, uh, and COVID stopped it, and they rearranged. They eventually went for the festival. I would say the three things that she likes most in life are cider. Young farmers and riding horses. Those are the three things she likes most in life. I'm glad you got um, all the words in the right order. She, yeah, she thought it was absolutely amazing. She loved it. I said to her, didn't they charge you a fortune to get in? Wasn't it like 14 quid for a gin and tonic? Impossible to get served, blah, blah, blah. She said, no, I loved it. And then she asked me about Royal Ascot. She's going to go to Royal Ascot now. So um, I don't know whether that's an advertisement for, you know, a lot of, you often hear, oh, you know, it's all about cramming people in. They all go and get drunk. They don't really know anything about horse racing and they're singing and stuff. Um, I think those people do end, sometimes end up going to other race meetings and, and that's not such a bad thing, is it, really? That is a, that's an incredibly... Um, alternative view to the prevailing wisdom. Well, in terms of the five days, you're expressing enthusiasm. In terms of the five day festival, it's obviously terrible to dilute the product. You know, it's supposed to be the Olympics of horse racing. It gets worse and worse. You know, we've got these intermediate distances and all that kind of thing. It's definitely going to happen, though, and probably they're just going to have to add two races. You're going to be down to six races a day. The two races that they add will probably be that novices chase that they handicap chase that they dropped two years ago, uh, and and some other nonsense race like a some kind of veterans mares hurdle or something. I mean, it's awful to keep <laughs> diluting the product, but it is going to happen because it makes sense. Uh, for the race course in terms of their bottom line. Uh, you got one word, five days, yes or no, Roger? I haven't got a problem with it. There we are. Um, I, 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 you're going to, you're getting cross because we're being, we're being flippant about something that is clearly very important. And as such, uh, in just a moment, I'll be talking to Ian Renton. <laughs> 